75 Squadron was about to go into action in defence of Australia at the front line, which had moved back here to Port Moresby. The enemy advance had reached Ley, a township only 190 miles to the north, across the high, jungle-thick mountains of the Owen Stanley Ranges. Under a lazy Australian administration, Moresby had been a colonial backwater. But once its strategic importance became crucial, 2,000 Australian militia were rushed here in a last-ditch attempt to protect the final stepping stone before Queensland. When the Japanese bombs began to fall in February 1942, it became obvious that Moresby would not survive without air defence. War correspondent Osma White described the situation. The defenders of Moresby were mostly militia draftees who'd received only perfunctory training before being sent to battle stations. As the bombings continued, they started to ask, where the hell are our planes? Early in March, there was a rumour that Australian fighter squadrons with P-40 Kitty Hawks were due to arrive any time, and morale rose sharply. But as the weeks passed and the Kitty Hawks didn't come, it began to lag again. Then for days, there were rumours that the Kitty Hawks would arrive tomorrow. So they became known as Tomorrow Hawks, and eventually as Never Hawks. Then, on March the 20th, they finally came. Their base was to be here at Seven Mile Strip, just outside Port Moresby. It was guarded by frightened Australian machine gunners, their own nerves shot to pieces after six weeks of being bombed and strafed by enemy aircraft with a monopoly on the skies. So when the first four Kitty Hawks lowered their flaps to land, the troops immediately assumed that these new planes were Japanese as well. They opened fire, severely damaging two of our aircraft and almost killing one pilot. The Army at that stage had never seen a Kitty Hawk. Uh, they'd heard about them and heard about yeah. them and heard about them, the Tomorrow Hawks. Yes, the them. Never Hawks. And, uh, and eventually they turned up and uh, somebody said, that one's got a Z on, it's a zero. <laughs> and they opened up on them with their machine guns. Fortunately, no one was killed, but two aircraft were destroyed. And the commanding officer got a bullet through the back of his uh, cushion behind his head. Um, he wasn't terribly pleased. He leapt out of the aircraft and rushed up the, the hill, brandishing his pistol. He's going to shoot him. <laughs> Fifty years later, that incident might seem amusing, but it was hardly an auspicious beginning. The squadron had now lost two pilots and five aircraft without sighting the enemy or even firing a shot in anger. But barely an hour later, their run of bad luck ended at last. A Japanese bomber appeared, stooging complacently over the town. Two pilots, Wilbur Wackett, a Melbourne University student, and Barry Cox, the Sydney stockbroker's clerk, raced for the two serviceable Kitty Hawks and took off to intercept it, while all of Moresby watched. Two Kitties took off, intercepted her over the mountains, drove her back, and after a brilliant attack, shot her down into the harbour. First real evidence of aggression in this war, wacko. We onlookers fell on one another's necks, howling hysterically with joy. From miles around, men came roaring up to the airfield in lorries, cheering and laughing. They stared with a mixture of awe and disbelief at this first fighter squadron. Its arrival was really an event of immense importance. Now there would be some kind of fight, instead of a hopeless, bloody walkover. Well, these people were dead. They had no hope, they had no protection. They felt that the Japanese could sail around as they tried to eventually at the Coral Sea Battle and take Moresby at any time. And they were being bombed and strafed every day without any opposition at all. But the arrival of the Kitty Hawks just lifted the place so high that it was wherever you went, they'd yell and scream and raise their hands and salute and wave to you. They were very happy to see us. That night in his tent, John Jackson devised a daring plan for the squadron's first combat mission. He was pretty sure the Japanese bomber had been destroyed before it could radio back to its base the news that his fighters had arrived. So the next morning, the enemy planes would all be lined up at the airstrip, 
ready for their usual unopposed attack on Moresby. That's where 75 Squadron would seek them and strike. We flew in formation over the mountains and then down, came down low to the sea and then approached low from the seaward side. We had the, the, the top cover came in higher and then we went in strafing. We made one pass and we thought that there seemed to be no action up above, so we turned and made a second pass on the way out. So they went straight in strafing in two lines. The Japanese had a very uh, strange way of lining their aircraft up in those days. They had the bombers down one side and the fighters down one, the other side in lines. And um, our strafers split into two and just strafed each strafed a line of either bombers or fighters. Second radar I got too low and I hit the propeller of this aircraft. You actually got low enough to hit the propeller of one of the grounded bombers? Yes, and it made a good bit of a clang. And I hadn't realised that the gun had fallen out, but that's what happened. And it severed the spar, which is a tribute to the aircraft that it um, kept on going all right. It got you home? Yes, I had an unpleasant um, ten minutes or so I was, we were being chased out by that time and I, my one vivid impression of the war really is that when you have a cannon attack from opposing aircraft it looks like cricket balls dipped in petrol behind you and all of a sudden zip they go past you like that and that is uh, disconcerting I think. When we were first attacked at Lai I could tell from the emblems, but Australians who attacked us. Until we got to Lai, we had fought a number of battles, but we had always been on the side of the attack. It was the first time that we were being attacked. I felt, gosh, this is going to be some fight. That attack on Lai, a spectacular success, was the squadron's baptism of fire. From then on, it would be a deadly daily grind of kill or be killed. The Japanese soon retaliated with bombing raids on Seven Mile Strip, backed up by low-flying zeros who returned the strafing the Kitty Hawks had done to them at Ley. Young men who'd spent just a few hours in their new aircraft were now trapped in a terrible battle for survival. We've seen a lot of action since we arrived, practically every day. The boys already have five scalps and have destroyed a lot of aircraft on the ground. Les had three Jap fighters after him the other day and managed to shoot one down. A nice bit of work. I think we'll hold the yellow bastards here. We've already given them a few decent cracks. It was a great mess in the sky. You just, if you had a chance to shoot something that had a big red roundel on the side instead of red, white, well, we cut out the red, uh, the white and the blue of the of the Australian roundel on the side. You didn't shoot at those, you shot at the ones with the big red roundels on the side, and, uh, and that was exciting. One day when we were escorting the American dive bombers to over delay, I think I shot down two zeros, one of which had some interest because uh, the pilot proceeded to get out, and so I was able to shoot him on the wing, which gave me some satisfaction, I suppose. Looking back, it was not very nice, but. In the old days, they said, Be beware of a hun in the sun. I can recall one time flying over Moresby, probably about 4,000 feet, and I felt this reaction on my armour plate. I never knew the zero was there, and it was only a case of putting the nose down. And when I put the nose down, the zero must have overshot me and lost me. What does it sound like, zero bullets on your armour plate behind you? Probably piano, piano notes without the music. <laughs> Just a thumping sound, a shock sound. In, in the escape with the zeros behind me, yeah, I, my uh, rudder bar, I lost the control of the rudder bar, which sort of started to become loose in my feet uh, through the uh, uh, being hit by the aircraft and I thought well it's a, not a good place to be <laughs> but I thought well I'll go and do a wheels up on the land and I thought strike me lucky this is just happening in your mind I thought strike me lucky they'll kill me and I was too low to jump out so I thought well I'll go in the water and uh, I then sort of 
pulled the throttle off and uh, went, um, carried out a, a first water landing at a P-40. And uh, successfully, uh, because it just bounced a couple of times, I must have done everything right, uh, so the zeros were doing everything wrong. For some unaccountable reason, the zero came up in a very high turn in enough time for me to get with all the power I could exercise on the stick and on the foot to get into the turn and I just had him uh, sitting there. Uh, in your sights? Yes, in a hard turn and I was able to get about an aeroplane's lead mm -hmm. on him and just started pulling the trigger. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I saw half the wing fall off and bits come off the cow. And so you'd been there for a week and you'd got your first zero? Yes. What did it feel like? Uh, Were you proud? Were you... In retrospect, it feels horrible. Mm. At the time, elated. Just a sense of great victory. The feeling of excitement uh, because I had achieved what we were there to achieve, I guess. No official photographic record was ever made of 75 Squadron at Port Moresby. All we have are a handful of illegal private photographs taken mostly by the pilots and in defiance of strict censorship. Their commander, John Jackson, was himself a keen home movie maker and he took his clockwork camera to war. He snatched these brief evocative moments one grey afternoon outside the operations tent at Seven Mile Strip. They remain the only motion picture records of that time. Not quite hidden by the smiles is the strain and fatigue already showing on the pilots' faces. These men were, quite literally, confronting death every time they took off. Uh, if they wanted the pilots to go and sit in their aircraft in readiness for takeoff, they'd fire one shot. Then, if they wanted you to scramble, they'd fire uh, three shots, whereupon you'd start the motor up, all taxi back down to the bottom of the hill and take off uh, in some sort of order and try to get together. We'd be sitting around, playing cards, talking, writing letters, and the telephone was on the post of the tent. That would ring, and Stu Collier, uh, our intelligence officer, generally answered it, and he'd yell, it's on. It's on, or he'd yell, pilots. And of course, then it was, that's when the adrenaline started, and you'd race out, jump into the cockpit, you'd be getting your helmet on, strapped up, etc., and make sure your microphone's right, and your oxygen works, and away you'd go. Um, what that, was that was the worst time of all, because it was a moment of truth. I always found that it, I felt a lot better once you opened the throttle of the aircraft to become airborne and uh, then when things happened, when things happened, uh, you were too busy to worry about it. Uh, and this is what happened to me. Uh, and and I, I used to get, I used to think awful things on the ground and you know, whilst I was whining, but once you got airborne, it was a different, I felt a different kettle of fish. And, well, you had uh, no time to think, did you? No, no time whatsoever. And when you got back in, you sort of thought, oh, gee, how lucky you were again. Everybody's scared if their life is threatened. People without fear, in my opinion, don't really display courage. The people who have courage are the ones who are afraid and control it and still carry out their responsibilities. On the ground, the squadron medical officer, Bill Dean Butcher, was battling against an enemy as deadly as any Japanese Zero. Living conditions at the Seven Mile Strip were appalling. Without penicillin, without even the most basic tropical health facilities, the doc waged his private war against disease. I think most historians would report that almost every war in the past has finally been won or lost on, on the state of health of the people concerned. And if they're ravaged with uh, malaria or smallpox or dysentery or whatever, uh, they're not going to win. Uh, well, the worst was at the strip when we first got there. Our toilets were a shovel and a piece of newspaper. And we'd just disappear into the cuneo grass and dig a hole. 
Now, gastroenteritis, uh, as most people know, will, will produce not only uh, liquid uh, stools, but also gas in the abdomen. Uh, if there's a bubble of gas and uh, you go from ground level to 20,000 feet, that multiplies in size. Uh, if it can be passed at either end of the alimentary tract, well, that's good news. Uh, if it can't, well, then there's distension and the bowel gets blown up and there's pain. And it's not easy to uh, fight for your life uh, if you have a severe pain in the gut. I think dysentery would be the big problem. It was even necessary to move our camp because of the amount of uh, dysentery suffered. What happened when you flew with dysentery? <laughs> Well, it's embarrassing on the ground, but it's more embarrassing in the air. But fortunately, we had a very good set of flying boots. I see. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the leakage uh, was in inevitable. So, so you'd leak and it would uh, leak yeah, well, all the time. You, 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 you always had to uh, probably w have a change of shorts and wash those and stick them on the long grass. Uh, during the day, at least while he had the active gastro. What about dengue fever and malaria, with yeah. which uh, a number of our fighter pilots did, did fly with those conditions? They did, yes, uh, and of course, uh, sometimes they vomited in the cockpit or onto the, uh, the windscreen, and uh, it's difficult to keep an oxygen mask on if you happen to be vomiting at the same time. I had uh, malaria pretty badly. I, finally, I put the airplane down after having vomited all over the windscreen and I couldn't mm. see anything. And uh, I was uh, pretty unconscious when they... Mm. But the airplane got down all right. It, mm. uh, they seem to do what they will, you want them to do, uh, even if you're not touching them sometimes. In just a fortnight, 75 Squadron had established itself as a real match for the Japanese but their losses were severe, and it was already proving a struggle to get enough Kitty Hawks into the air every day. Clearly, they needed to make another damaging strike against their opponent's base on the other side of the island. At dawn on April the 7th, John Jackson took off on a reconnaissance over enemy territory, a dangerous mission, one he always insisted on performing alone. That morning, he was jumped by three Zeros, who shut up his engine and forced him to crash land in the sea. His adventures over the next two weeks are recounted in a letter he wrote to his wife and children as soon as he got back to base. My aircraft sank in a few seconds. As I was swimming in, the croc poked his snout at me but didn't approve and turned away. The natives ashore seemed frightened, but two good lads, mission taught, offered to guide me. My feet are pretty bad. Staggered on all day yesterday. Towards the end, climbing a mountain. The boys took turns pushing me. Had some anxious moments wondering if the Japanese would catch up as we could move only very slowly. My feet are the trouble. This morning they felt like two pulps and I could hardly bear to touch them with my hand, let alone stand. I'm constantly wondering if you've heard I'm missing. I trust not. Struggled all day. Leeches by the million. Could have been snake sucking at me and I wouldn't have felt them. My feet were so sore. <laughs> 